Hello, Mission CISD students. My name is Christopher Canthou. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Today, with the help of Maricela Ponce and Jeanette Ballesteros, we will be talking to you about spring break safety and coping with grief. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little more about what a licensed professional counselor is, or LPC for short. An LPC is a counselor who specifically works one-to-one -one with a client to provide counseling therapy uh, when they're having an emotional issue. An LPC can also provide a client with a mental health diagnosis. Clients will normally see their LPC once a week for some time until their symptoms improve. There are different ways that you can talk to a counselor um, in our district. Um, every Mission CISD student uh, can uh, uh, talk to someone if they need to. The best way to connect with a therapist would be to contact your school counselor, let them know that you are having some trouble and they may be able to send you our way. Another way you can contact us, uh, you can get onto the Mission CISD website, um, the main page, and scroll down just a bit and you'll see the Emotional Counseling Help icon as you see here below. You click on that and you'll get sent to the LPC website. Once you're on the LPC website, uh, on the bottom right or in the middle right hand corner, you'll see the words um, Ask an LPC. If you click on that, you'll be able to directly email us at lpc at mcsd.org. Uh, you can also contact us at our different school locations, uh, and I'll give you our contact information just uh, a, little a little after the uh, presentation. Uh, Ms. Ana Pada and Mr. Mark Garza are stationed at Mission High School. Mr. Garza also works at KY Junior High and the Feeder Elementary Schools. Ms. Jeanette Gonzalez Ballesteros uh, works at Mission Collegiate. And she also sees clients at Options, uh, Roosevelt, Ulta Memorial Junior High, and Cavazos Elementary. Ms. Maricela Ponce and myself, um, Christopher Ganthu, do work out of Veterans High School. I also uh, see clients out of Ralph Ganthu Junior High, Mission Junior High, and the Feeder Elementary Schools. Today, we'll be talking about teen risky behaviors. We'll be discussing how certain behaviors can affect uh, our mental and physical health. Uh, we are coming up on spring break, so we do want to make sure that everyone is careful and safe. Along the same lines, uh, when it comes to TikTok challenges, we know you'll have some extra time and we know it's a fun thing to do and people will have extra time next week. So we want everybody to understand the dangers of taking part in certain risky online challenges. And uh, briefly, we will also talk about the dangers of um, the internet and how to avoid them. Uh, Moreover, we're going to also talk about grief and loss and managing grief. In the last year of this pandemic, we have um, undergone a lot of different changes and we've uh, experienced some loss and grief because of that loss. So we'll talk about what that is and how to manage it in healthy ways. And then finally, we're going to talk about tips for um, coping with COVID stress. This last year has brought us a lot of stress and we're going to continue having some stress due to it. So we'll talk a little bit how to care for ourselves um, while we're continuing to learn from home. Teen risky behaviors, events that can have a deep effect on your health and well-being. What is a risky behavior? A risky behavior is any action or activity that can cause potential harm to the individual as a consequence of what he or she chooses to do. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word or the phrase spring break? I bet most of you are thinking about South Pride Island, right? Or maybe some of you are thinking about mm, maybe binge watching on some movies, sleeping for five days. All of that is, is good. There's nothing wrong in wanting to take a break from work, homework. Um, we're coming to a one year anniversary of, of being in a pandemic. So some of you may want to like get out of the house, take advantage, right? Um, some of you may be traveling to another city. However, during this time of the year, research has shown that many teenagers end up dipping into risky behaviors that oftentimes lead to really serious consequences. What you see here are the consequences of reckless driving, heavy drinking, drug use, and all night parties. These are the consequences. This is these type of risky behaviors leads to car accidents, promiscuous and forced sex, physical assaults, or petty crimes. 
According to the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC, spring break traffic fatalities are 9% higher among drivers under the age 25. During normal times throughout the year, a drunk driving accident claims the life of one driver every 31 minutes. Drunk driving deaths increase by at least 23% during spring break. So how does alcohol affect our organ system? How do drugs affect the organ system? Remember that the brain is part of the central nervous system. And in our brain, we have nerve cells, also known as mortar neurons. Now these cells send messages to other cells to do jobs. When someone is under the influence of alcohol or drugs, these messages that are being sent from cell to cell, they get disrupted because of the alcohol and drugs. Sometimes these messages not only get distorted, but they also don't get through. So car accidents, for example, remember that alcohol is a suppressant. It slows down your breathing. It slows down your motor skills. When I say motor skills, I'm talking about like lifting your arms, walking, sitting up straight, and also your decision-making. I remember that alcohol and drugs, what they do is that they mess around with what we call your brain chemistry. So when someone's under the influence and they're driving, they're not gonna be as quick to react to a red light or quick to react to stop and not hit a car or someone walking. What about promiscuous and forced sex? Oftentimes when people are under the influence of drugs or alcohol, remember what I said about thinking skills, about decision-making skills? Well, remember that it suppresses it. The messages from one cell to the next other cell does not get transmitted. So we don't, we're not able to stop and think of the consequences of our behavior. You may feel like, well, it's not a big deal. But on the other hand, if you were not under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you would have an opportunity of stopping and thinking and evaluating whether what you're doing is really a proactive or positive thing to do. Is this gonna cause me harm? Physical assaults. Oftentimes what you see on TV, uh, it's similar to the real life. So what happens? Remember that alcohol messes with your brain chemistry. Some people, when they drink, they get very aggressive. They get very violent and they feel very brave, okay? It's affecting our motor skills and our decision-making skills. So oftentimes people who drink get aggressive, they overreact, and maybe they end up with probably getting into a fight, an altercation. Sometimes people drink to a point where they pass out and don't remember, and the next day they find themselves being like having bruises, bad guys, they don't remember getting into an assault the night before. Petty crimes. How many of us have been watching TV and seen episodes of on the news of people doing what they call a beer run, running to the store, grabbing beer and leaving? But again, this is a risky behavior that leads to these type of uh, this, this type of um, of um, actions that causes harm. So, in the next slide. What you see here are the consequences of risky behaviors that can lead to death. Binge drinking and drug use can lead to balcony falls, boating and jet ski injuries, alcohol poisonings, drug overdose, and drownings. Safe boating doesn't mix with alcohol or drugs. Reckless behaviors on the water causes severe injuries, including face lacerations, limb amputations, concussions, brain damage, and death. You're on a jet ski, you're on a boat, you're, uh, you're drinking, you're doing drugs, you're having a good time, and what happens? Because of, uh, of the behaviors or the activities that you're dipping into, let's say you fall over the boat, trying to swim back, remember, it affects your motor skills. Uh, so are you gonna be able to swim as you would normally if you weren't under the influence? No. So this is where you, this research and statistics show how people end up getting face lacerations. They get cut with the blades of the boat. Um, they uh, hurt their limbs. 
Um, so some, it could be some se very severe and serious repercussions of voting uh, under the influence. Binge drinking leads to serious injuries, including alcohol poisoning, brain damage, and death. Alcohol poisoning is when there's too much alcohol in your blood and it causes parts of your brain to shut down. It's also called alcohol overdose. Alcohol is, is a depressant. That means that it can affect your brain and nervous system, just like I was mentioning earlier. Slow down your breathing, affects your heart rate, slows down your heart rate. Drug overdose. Drug use among teens and college students during spring break accounts for many accidents, injuries, and deaths. Drugs like heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, opioids, fentanyl, all these are dangerous drugs that often recklessly passed around without regard of the side effects and overdose risk. These type of behaviors or these type of activities of drug use can cause heart attacks, seizures. So in the combination of alcohol and drugs and then these activities can often lead to serious, serious consequences. And remember, the effects of brain chemistry. So we're not, not going to make the best decisions when we're under the influence. That's what we have to be safe. Drownings. Drownings, uh, since spring break involves a lot of water-related activities and pool parties, there's a good chance of, a, of someone being under the influence and uh, drowning accidentally. So out of all of these risky behaviors, there's there has been at least one example I remember at least means that there would be more than one one example that has occurred here in the valley so it's not something that is that is new or something that is not uncommon this is what the research shows and demonstrates so no one is saying that you cannot have a good time but you gotta be safe stop and think before you go out your door Hello, my name is Jeanette Ballesteros. I am a licensed professional counselor with Mission Collegiate High School. I also am the counselor for other feeder schools. I am here to discuss with you the dangers of TikTok challenges and online games. What do some TikTok challenges have in common? Well, some challenges can be fun, such as dance challenges or singing challenges or even cooking challenges. And some challenges can be impactful, like the ice bucket challenge that was extremely popular a few years ago. However, some challenges are dangerous, such as any challenge that suggests you engage in dangerous activities. Our suggestion to you is to be smart. Do not put your health or your lives at risk. Please, please avoid these challenges. Some other dangers to be aware of are some gaming dangers or online gaming dangers. Surfing the web and gaming online can be tons of fun. Uh, it has provided students with the opportunity to socialize and to hang out with friends online, especially during this pandemic. But sometimes predators can be lurking online looking for new victims. Gaming platforms is a perfect space for these people to operate and to stock kids. So some friendly tips or reminders would be to not share your passwords. Do not share your passwords ever. Don't share any personal information like your real name, your address, your date of birth your social security number, your school information or what grade you're in, or your parents' names. All of this can, you know, lead back to you. It's identifiable information and you need to be really, really careful. Think before you post and don't befriend people you don't know. Don't share pictures of yourself or video chat with anyone. We can't assume that these people are friends so it's better to be safe than sorry. Here is a list of red flags you should be aware of and keep an eye out to avoid any future problems. So if you meet someone online or on a, on a gaming website, 
if you feel like they are stalking you outside of that website or that gaming platform, we need to be really careful. Like for instance, if you if that person keeps appearing on various social media platforms or they send you friend requests outside of the gaming platform, that's a huge red flag. They start requesting pictures of you or video chats with you outside of the game. Or they ask you to keep your friendship or relationship a secret. In reality, there's no reason to keep any relationship a secret. This is a huge red flag. If they try to meet up in person or they keep suggesting it even though you've already declined those invitations. Um, red flag. If they prefer to talk in private um, or outside of the gaming uh, community. This is isolated behavior that predators use to attempt to control another person and to establish a friendship and to establish trust. Be careful. Uh, be wary if they ask lots of personal questions that have nothing to do with the game or the context of the situation. If it seems too personable, if it seems weird, or it just gives you like a funny, funky, um, creepy feeling, it probably is. So that would be a great indicator to break off any contact with this person. Another thing to think about is if they're just too agreeable, like they agree with everything that you say, or they laugh a little too much at your jokes, or they try to make you feel special. This is classic grooming behavior that should raise a red flag. Be really careful with these people. This is how they establish trust and establish friendships. Some other dangers to be aware of while online gaming, of course, is cyberbullying. You may be cyberbullied or you may bully others. Um, it's okay to be competitive online. It's, it's fun sometimes, but it's not okay to be cruel. It's not okay to be rude. And it's not, to, it's not okay to be critical of others. Remember that this is a game that you're playing and it's not personal. Be mindful of other people's feelings. Of course, privacy issues, another reminder of that. Sometimes predators are looking for information and you may not even realize that personal information is being released via your computer, your console, or your device. Be careful with the information you have listed. Also be mindful of your usernames. Make sure that they are vague and do not give any away any identifiable information. Webcam worries. Remember to log off your cameras when you walk away from your laptop or computer. Never do anything in front of the camera that you would not want shared with the world. A quick mistake can be devastating, so it's just best to log off each time and to close your laptop when you're done. And a few other things to remember, of course, is to be aware of hidden fees sometimes on these online gaming um, websites. You don't even realize that you're, you're racking up fees and it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. And be wary of malware as well. These are just some examples of the dangers you should be concerned with while gaming online. And so now we'll move on to talking about grief and loss. It's been quite a year. There's a lot of things that have happened to us in this last year. Of course, with the pandemic itself, you've had to also deal with virtual schooling. We've had a couple of natural um, uh, disasters that have happened, a hurricane and a winter storm when a lot of us here in the Valley did lose uh, things like possessions and, and, uh, and so on. Some of us have experienced death of a family member or friends or maybe a couple in the, in the same year. Um, other losses that we might have experienced, uh, maybe us or a parent has lost a job, maybe we've lost a pet, maybe we've had to move schools, move cities, or even move from our homes. Um, loss in the pandemic sometimes is not so visible. Sometimes it's something that we may not necessarily see. For example, maybe we've had a feeling of loss of freedom, not being able to do the things um, that we were able to do before. Maybe we've lost our routine. A lot of us uh, have felt what if, you know, the, the experience of losing routine uh, when it comes to school. Uh, we don't get up in the mornings like we used to. We don't have the same schedule like we used to, and maybe even a uh, schedule at night before going to bed. And so a lot of us are maybe going to bed a lot later. Um, in some cases, maybe we've had loss of privacy in the case that someone maybe lost 
a home and had to live with someone else. Um, you know, maybe you've had to share rooms now with somebody because, you know, people are moving in with each other. And that loss of privacy is pretty evident. Maybe a loss of safety, of course, you know, because of COVID-19, some of us just don't feel safe going out anymore. A loss of control as well. As we know, the virus is not something that we have control over. And so sometimes people just feel as if they don't have control over their lives anymore. And we've also lost predictability. We know, we knew before the virus came, we knew how things would go on a normal day basis. Uh, but now it seems that, you know, with new information coming out on the virus, um, you know, we can't be as predictable with what's going to happen in the coming weeks, days, and months. So a lot of us experience what we call grief. And grief is a deep sor sorrow experienced after an important loss. And it's much deeper than sadness. And it's not just regular sadness. Um, it's not really depression either. But if grief goes on long enough, it can lead to a depression. It is a normal response, especially when the loss was unexpected or when we were not completely prepared for it. Symptoms of grief include a numbness or an emptiness. You can't really feel joy, you can't really feel sadness. Some people feel very, very, very disturbed by that fact that they can't feel anything, they have that numbness to them. Some people just feel a, little, a lot more angry, they feel more irritable, grumpy. Sometimes we might have physical symptoms that we might notice, trouble sleeping, trouble eating, um, maybe more feeling more tired, maybe feeling, you know, muscle weakness or tiredness in our muscles, shakiness. Maybe we're having increased nightmares or even withdrawing from our friends and family. There are different stages of grief uh, that are said to occur. Um, the five that we'll be talking about are often talked about and don't always happen, uh, but if they do, it's important to know um, the definition of each of these stages. These stages don't go in order either. And some of these stages may happen more than once during a grief period. Denial is when someone is kind of blocking out or hiding from the facts. They really don't want to believe what has happened. Someone might say something like, my loved one isn't really dead. They just haven't made time to call me yet. This person is really trying to um, avoid the feeling of grief. They're trying to avoid sadness. They're trying to avoid everything that comes with finding out that you've had a major loss. Some people try to deal with those feelings by increasing anger. Anger can sometimes be used to avoid feeling vulnerable. When we're sad or feeling grief, uh, feeling grief, we feel as if we're vulnerable. So people will get more angry. People might say something like, why can't everyone just leave me alone? I'm fine. I'm not sad at all right now when they really are. Bargaining happens when someone is trying to regain control of the situation as you feel, feel control slipping away. And like I said earlier, the COVID virus is not something that we have control over. Um, so someone might say something like, God, I promise I will never be rude to anyone again if you just let my aunt live. And of course, again, these people are trying to find a way to put some control in their lives when they feel things are slipping out of control. Depression may occur too, and this is a feeling of sadness that lasts a, long, a longer time uh, until you begin to feel a loss of interest. It can interfere with how well you function and it can lead to more hopelessness. So someone might say something like, things will never get back to the way they were. I'll be sad forever. And again, depression is more than just regular sadness. It's sadness that does last for quite a while. And if we are grieving, and it goes on for a long period of time, it could eventually lead to depression. The final stage of grief is acceptance. And this is the stage that we hope that we can get to. Because once we're at this stage, we're acknowledging, we're understanding, we're knowing the facts of the situation. It doesn't mean that we agree with what's going on, but it, once we're at acceptance, it gives us the opportunity to eventually move forward in our lives. It does take some time to get there though. And once you're there, someone might say something like, this is happening, I'm gonna have to find a way to cope with it and move on. Managing grief um, can be quite simple if we think about it, you know, if we allow ourselves to manage the grief. One of the first things that we, we need to do is acknowledge what is going on, call it what it is. Don't attempt to explain it away or give it another name. Don't be afraid to feel emotional pain. All feelings are valid and have purpose. Anger, sadness, loneliness, 
they do feel awful, but they do have a purpose. So don't be afraid to feel that pain. When you feel that way, connect with others. Express your thoughts about what you're feeling, about what you're going through. Uh, connect with someone who is willing to listen to you without judgment or the need to give advice. This could be a close family member or a friend. You can create a new ritual. You can develop a way to remember your loved one, create a new activity associated with that person. You can invent a way to complete an activity in a way that remembers that person. For example, every year on their birthday, maybe you can still have a barbecue with friends and family and still celebrate the life of that person. Ask for help. Asking for help is very, very important when you are grieving and feel like you can't move past the grief. It could be the most difficult thing that you can do, but it's actually a sign of strength rather than a sign of weakness. And make sure that you do give your grief some time. There's no one right way to grieve. There's no timetable to follow. Your experience is as unique as you are. Be okay with relapses and use them as a learning tool. So for example, let's say six months have gone by and you feel a lot better after your loss. But then one day something reminds you of your loss and you begin to break down again and it takes you a couple of days to get back to where you were. We might consider that a relapse and that's okay because it might help you understand something or learn from the situation. Another way of managing our grief is to focus on what was not lost. Pay attention to what you still have. Look at what you have maybe gained from the situation. What is different now and actually better than before? And I joke around with people a lot and I say, you know, in this age of COVID and the pandemic, um, things are different now. Like, for example, takeout. When I go to my favorite restaurant, now we have curbside service. And hopefully that curbside service will stay because it's great to go to my favorite restaurants and don't really have to go dressed up. I can just go pick up my order and go back home and eat in the comfort of my own home. So focusing on the silver lining helps you to change your point of view and thus help you to change how you feel at a particular moment. Remember, feelings are not permanent, so be sure to monitor your thinking often. Let's talk a little bit about tips for coping with the COVID stress. So throughout uh, this pandemic, we have been dealing with extra stress in COVID. These are some of the typical stress reactions that you might feel. Feeling stressed, overwhelmed, frustrated or angry, worried or anxious, maybe feeling restless, agitated or on high alert. You just feel like you can't calm down. Maybe you feel sad, teary, fatigued, tired. Maybe you start to feel loss of interest in things you liked, to, you liked before. Maybe it might be more difficult to, for you to feel happy. Uh, you might find yourself worrying about going into public spaces and becoming unwell. Maybe you feel like you're going to contract of the virus or germs. Um, maybe you're constantly thinking about the situation and you're unable to cope or think about much else. And some of us might experience physical symptoms such as feeling more tired or just other uncomfortable situations in your body. So here are some ways to help improve your mind and body. Number one, maintain a daily routine with consistent sleep activity and study patterns. Keep a schedule. Try as best as possible to keep the schedule as close to your schedule when you were still going to in-person schooling. Wake up in early in the morning, do your classes, take a lunch break at the same time every day, and go to sleep and, and wake up at the same time every day. Stay connected with others and try to find moments of gratitude. Contact people, let them know that you appreciate them being there for you. Talk to people you feel comfortable with about your feelings or worries and give yourself permission to stop worrying. So once you talk to someone about how you feel, just leave it at that. You've let it out into the open, you've talked to someone about it, and move on with your day. Eat breakfast every morning. If possible, maintain a healthy diet with fruits and vegetables. Eat meals at regular times throughout the day. Okay, I think a lot of us have kind of turned to junk food to help us cope with stress. And that's pretty normal, but we, ought, we gotta understand that junk food may cause our mood to be worse. We need to eat foods that are going to give us a healthy amount of energy throughout the day and not something that'll just pick us up briefly and drop us back down like junk food does. Limit your coffee or energy drinks. I know it's popular nowadays for, for teens to drink coffee and energy drinks. Um, they're gonna increase your feelings of anxiety and make it difficult to relax. 
coffee and energy drink, energy drinks contain caffeine, which is a stimulant, it stimulates your mind and body. And if you're already feeling anxious, that's not what you want. Number six, look for patterns or be aware of a situation that makes you feel particularly worried or anxious. When you're in these situations, try relaxation or distraction techniques or ask a family member or friend to help. So you might notice that something keeps on happening the same way over and over. So look for those patterns and see what you can do differently to manage that stress or anxiety when you're in that situation. Number seven, relive times, I'm uh, sorry, relieve times of high anxiety with exercise, physical activity, or engaging in regular aerobic exercise. Our bodies are made to move around. So when we live a sedentary lifestyle, that means staying in one place all the time, our, our bodies don't react very well. So get up, move your body around, get outside, get some air, and um, get that body moving. Number eight, limit news and social media consumption. If you're finding information about COVID-19 overwhelming or distressing, we need to stop. Some of us are on the news outlets all the time, looking at all the newest information. But once we have new information, leave it at that. I say check your, your, your news once a week. Sometimes too much, it'd be too much for us. Number nine, do hobbies or activities that you enjoy that calm you down or focus your mind and body. These could be arts and crafts, physical activities, listening to music, reading, journaling, watching TV or movies, or connecting with friends, remotely, of course. So hobbies and activities are not a waste of time. Now we need to be careful to balance our hobbies and activities with work, of course. So it's, it's good to have fun, but it's also good to do work when we need to. Uh, when we're done with our work, we'll have time for our hobbies and activities to, to help us um, relax. Number 10, understand that the people around you are probably also finding the situation stressful and they might also be having difficulty controlling their emotions. So try to resolve conflict. So you might find that a lot of people in your life or around you are feeling grumpy or irritable. And number 11, if you continue to feel overwhelmed out of, or out of control or unable to calm down after a period of weeks, seek help from a mental health professional. And that's where we come in. Number 12, be kind to yourself and others. And we're all going to work through this together. Everyone involved uh, with you here at Mission CISD is here to help teachers, principals, um, counselors, and so on. We're here to help you and we're, we'll help you get through this together. Here's some mental health resources that we can contact. In the case that we are in crisis, an emotional crisis means that I feel like I'm gonna hurt myself or I feel like I'm going to hurt someone else. Make sure you tell a, an adult that is present in your home, someone who's responsible, let them know what's going on. You can contact 911. 24 seven. You can also call Tropical Texas Behavioral Health Crisis Hotline at 1-877-289-7199. And this is a hotline that you can call that's here in the Valley and uh, someone can assist you at any time of the day. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And then there are two of the three behavioral hospitals here in the Valley. You can go to one of these behavioral hospitals, get a free evaluation if you feel that you need to be hospitalized because you might harm yourself or others. So during this spring break, we just want to make sure that you keep yourself safe, you keep yourself safe and be responsible. Um, we want you to have a restful spring break. And if you have any questions for us or like to contact us, here's our information. Again, you can contact LPC at mcisd.org, you can email us. Or if you want to email us individually, Ms. Pada is over at Mission High School, uh, along with Mr. Mark Garza. Uh, myself, Chris Cantu, and Marisela Ponce are over at Veterans High School. And Jeanette Gonzalez Ballesteros is over at Collegiate High School Options and Roosevelt. Thank you for your time.